Hey folks, welcome back to the History Chat on Thursdays at one o'clock when I'm talking now about the history of the Republican Party. This is the fourth in the series on that party and how it changed from its original days to where it turned into today. And today what we're gonna take up is the change from the, the reconstruction years to the party's really dramatic switch toward big business in the 1870s. And there's a couple of things I wanna say here. The first is that the material that I'm gonna to cover today is controversial. Uh, I have a strong stand on this and I believe I can bring receipts for all of this. I will tell you that when I start talking about credit mobility, or the credit mobilier scandal. Um, that material is stuff you actually can look up on your own if you would like to. It's cited in my book on the Republican Party, uh, To Make Men Free, A History of the Republican Party. But you can also find it yourself in the, uh, in the Library of Congress's online newspaper database. This is all material from the New York Sun. And when I was originally in graduate school, getting your hands on the New York Sun in microfilm was like getting your hands on solid gold because it was really expensive. So even Harvard didn't have it. And I did manage to borrow it from another another library, but it was very difficult to use because it's, it's, it's voluminous and we had it microfilm for very brief periods of time. Now you can just go to the Library of Congress and read it, which is just a, a gold mine. So, um, so, you know, when people talk about the erasure of history, and bringing down monuments, the answer that historians have been making is that if you want to erase history, what you do is you defund the archives, you defund the Library of Congress, you defund universities. And that's a great example. So if you're interested in the stuff that I'm going to tell you about the credit mobilier, um, which I actually know really well, and I'll explain why, uh, the, you, can, you can go read it yourself and you can decide whether or not you think that I'm telling the truth. And it's... Um, it is an incredible story, and it's way more than I was ever able to put in any book. So I'll do what I can to get to, um, to that all today. All right, so let me start here. I left you with the idea of Reconstruction and what the Republican Party was trying to accomplish during Reconstruction, and why it was in such a terrible position because of the rise of Andrew Johnson into the presidency after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. All right, so where I left you was with the idea that the Republican Party uh, represented in Congress really wanted to, um, to guarantee that African-American men especially could join in the free labor economy that they had fought the war to preserve. And today, um, that's all going to come crashing down. So what happens, I left you, I think, with the election of... Um, of Ulysses S. Grant and, uh, and what that meant. And one of the things that Grant did in his uh, can election campaign in 68, when of course he's not, you know, people aren't running for office in those days. Um, you, you stayed home and tried to keep your mouth shut basically so you didn't upset anybody. But one of the things that he really emphasized in his campaign is that he was all about peace. You know, he, he, um, he, his campaign slogan was, let us have peace. And what he was really trying to do was to dial the, the political scene back to the days before Andrew Johnson, to try and start what really should have been a Republican reconstruction. And I'll say right off the bat here that I'm a huge fan of Grant. He, there was a long period when he was denigrated, and this is where you get the stories about him being, you know, a, a dumb alcoholic and all that. He's actually a brilliant man, and he is... Um, uh, a brilliant man, not only in his um, in his approach to the military, but also in his uh, in his brain. I mean, he's he's actually he actually manages to start really a new form of American literature, the realist school, uh, when he writes his memoirs, and he. Um, he actually has uh, a very different attitude toward, you, you hear nowadays a lot about how terrible he was to Native Americans. In fact, he, um, a lot happens under his watch, um, but, but he was really actually trying to treat the Native Americans right, as opposed to his predecessor who wanted to, to kill them, and William Tecumseh Sherman who wanted to exterminate them. Uh, Grant actually had uh, a close relationship with a Seneca Indian himself, and, um, and, and felt that, that Indians were getting a bad shake in America. So he's a really complicated figure, but he is one on the whole that I think has been given an unfair uh, uh, historical reputation. And I'll explain why in just a minute. All right, so one of the things to remember about Grant is he is elected, and I told you he's elected with the help of African-American votes in the South, uh, but he is a Westerner and he is he went to West Point, but he was so, he was so um, 
unenthusiastic about his studies that during the war, somebody asked him uh, what he thought of the military strategy that was outlined in West Point's major textbook. And he didn't know what the textbook was, which suggests that he was not exactly gluing himself to his studies. He was more a uh, uh, learn by the seat of your pants kind of guy. And, um, and he, uh, he was, like I say, he was a Western. He was a backwoods bumpkin the same way that, that Lincoln was. And that didn't sit very well with the Eastern Republicans who really saw themselves as the backbone of the party. And this matters when, when um, Grant is elected because the person who really thinks that he should be the head of the party is Charles Sumner. Now, you probably remember from a couple of weeks ago, Charles Sumner is an early advocate of pushing back against the slave power. He's the guy who um, is a vocal abolitionist. He's the guy who is beaten almost to death on the Senate floor in defense of Northern principles. And he is really a leading senator. He's Harvard educated. He has great uh, connections. He's actually really annoying in Congress because every time he gets up to make a speech, he lards it with Greek and Latin and proves that he knows more than everybody else. In fact, usually when he gets up to speak, everybody heads for the exits because they don't want to sit through his really condescending speeches. But he's a bright, well-connected man and, um, and, and believes in equality. And so he looks at Grant, who is, you know, doesn't have any of that polish and, and has it, it just just doesn't hasn't been in politics and you know Sumner looks at him and he just thinks how do we elect this guy the person who should be in charge of the Republican Party is me and that split between Grant and Sumner is going to be huge for the rest of American history which is so weird if you think about it you know we're in this moment now where you you listen you think about the fact that Mitch McConnell has so much power and the idea that a lot of what I'm going to tell you comes down to this animosity between these two guys is actually kind of mind bending for somebody like me who does politics sort of from the ground up and tries to say this is how politics is is changed by the way people think. But in this case, these two men hold extraordinary power and they um, they clash and that clash is going to affect where we are. Well, today. Anyway, so the first thing that happens is Grant gets into office and he, of course, does not have political connections. He has military connections. And one of the reasons he was so effective as a military officer was in part because he wasn't hidebound by what was happening in the military, in part because he hadn't paid any attention to it when he's in, in um, I, I'm sorry, I have a soft spot for people who don't pay very, very good attention in college. I was one of them. Um, but he, uh, instead of doing what was normal at the time, which is when it came time to make to make appointments in the government, because in these days you didn't have a civil service, you didn't, you're not going to get um, a merit-based civil service until at least next week's talk, um, until 1883. But so um, he. Uh, people filled positions in the government by um, by uh, patronage, you know, you because this is a Republican government, they're going to be Republicans in those positions. And um, and generally, uh, the president gave a lot of leeway to the senators, especially but also to representatives, but especially to the senators to decide who would get which positions in their states. Well, Grant doesn't want to do that because he doesn't want to be politically beholden and he doesn't like the idea of his government belonging to the politicians, which um, kind of makes sense, really, right? Because he's come from a place where, in the military, where you're, who you were connected to generally meant um, the, the people who got promoted based on their, their political connections tended not to be very good. And the ones who were really good were the ones who were promoted based on their skills. So he thinks he's going to bring that into the government. So he starts to appoint, to kind of ignore the senators and to appoint whomever he thinks is going to be best, even though, again, he doesn't have a lot of experience in politics. So it's a little hard for him to know who's going to be best. Well, the senators instantly get really mad because their base of political support in their states but relies on the system of patronage. So right out of the box, they start to say that he is engaging in cronyism in the idea that he's putting his own people, his own pets, if you will, into positions of power. Now, um, so, so we're going to develop over the course of today this idea that Grant is corrupt, which, by the way, I don't think he was at all. And But this is where it comes from, this idea, first of all, that they're getting cut out. So they say, you know, he's, he's, he's appointing his own people because he's just appointing his favorites. And he is appointing people who were loyal to him and whom he had worked with before, but he is not on the take or anything. He's simply doing it without 
trying to get involved in the, in the political side of things. So the senators turn against him and they start to, I mean, they really were a little leery of him anyway. Like again, uh, Summer and, and the Eastern people didn't like him. Sumner's crowd didn't like him, but they, they start to say that he is uh, filling, he's, he's filling positions through cronyism and they start to make fun of him. So I actually found a, a, a memoir where they talked about being in the Senate cloakroom and literally making fun of him um, in the Senate cloakroom, which is, just uh, to make fun of the president of your own party right out of the box in a really kind of schoolyard way. It's just a really ugly moment early on. So what happens is Grant's no idiot. He hears this and he stops paying a lot of attention to this older old guard Republican cadre, if you will, led by Charles Sumner. And when he does that, he starts to pay a lot more attention to younger senators, younger senators who don't get along very well with that old guard. And they're led by um, the New York's a senator from New York, the junior senator from New York, a guy named Roscoe Conkling. And I've talked about Conkling in other in other forms because Conkling is going to be very important to the rise of um, big business in the late 19th century. But right now he's just a guy and he's I mean, he's a senator guy, but he's not he's not Roscoe Conkling yet. He's just Roscoe Conkling. And he. Um, he uh, is a really, really fascinating character because he's very politically astute. But what he wants for himself is not to have really a national political career. He decides early on that all he wants to do is run New York because New York is the linchpin for the entire country. And I'll explain why in a second. But, but New York has been run until the rise of Roscoe Conkling, really, by a man named Thurlow Weed. And Thurlow Weed is a name that most of you probably haven't heard, but he's enormously important in, um, in, in politics before the Civil War. Because if you're going to be an important political figure in the North before the Civil War, you need to, to have New York I'm sorry, in the North, you need to have New York on your side. And in order to have New York on your side, you have to have the New York newspapers on your side. And in order to have the New York newspapers on your side, you have to have their mentor on your side. And that mentor is Thurlow Weed. So Thurlow Weed becomes this enormously powerful behind the scenes guy. Well, all Roscoe Conkling wants to do is he pretty much wants to take over for Thurlow Weed. And he wants to do that partly because of the sheer power of it. But also partly because part, along with patronage goes the idea that when you get a job for somebody, they owe you and they owe you not only their political loyalty, but usually a cut of money. And in order to get, you know, that that in order to do that, you have to run the system, but you also um, you 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 want to have a state base and Conkling likes his beautiful clothes and he likes his fast women and he likes his nice food. And this is the way for him really to do that without getting involved in the rough and tumble of national politics. Now, um, I don't really have the time to tell you this story, but I will because I like I say, I went to bed at five o'clock this morning, so I'm really punchy. Um, uh, one of the things Roscoe Conkling is famous for in the 19th century, I told you last week, is that he is uh, considered to be one of the handsomest men in America. And I suggested you might want to go look at a picture of that. Um, uh, sensibilities change. Anyway, he is was famous in the 19th century for having an affair with um, uh, um, Portland, uh, with Sam and P. Chase's daughter, Kate. I told you about Kate Chase before, and Kate Chase is really the the bell of um, of uh, Civil War Washington, and in basically she marries very, a, a guy named named Senator William Sprague from Rhode Island in order to get access to his to his money. He's very wealthy, um, in order that she can bankroll her father's um, campaign for the presidency. And the marriage is miserable from the start. Anyway, she ends up having an affair with Roscoe Conkling. And, um, and that becomes this enormous 19th century scandal. And much of the other stuff I know about that um, is sort of rumor that historians talk about. And because this is going to live forever on the internet, I'm not gonna tell you some more of the stories, but if you're interested, there's some wonderful books about Kate Chase and about um, basically how uh, this affair with Roscoe Conkling um, becomes this enormous cause celeb in the 19th century. Anyway, so Grant starts to hang out with Roscoe Conkling, who is not yet this powerful senior senator, as he's going to be. And, um, and 
the older people look at this and they look at the fact that Conkling is, if not corrupt, pretty close to it. And that doesn't help Grant's uh, reputation as being corrupt. It's because he is hanging around with Conkling, who treats him well, who treats him with respect and doesn't make fun of him in the cloakroom. Uh, Conkling also, by controlling New York, also has the ability to swing the next election in the sense that, as I keep saying here, New York is crucially important in the late 19th century because it has so many electoral votes. So after the, um, the census of 1870, New York is going to have 36 uh, votes in the Electoral College. That's more by far than anybody else. The next state down is Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania only has 29, and then they go downhill real fast till you're into the, the teens and then into the single digits. So if you want to lock the presidency, you really want to lock New York if you possibly can. And, and the Republicans know they've got a problem because they're not going to be able to hold the South forever. And I'll explain why in just a minute. So while all this is going on, um, Grant is really, again, not aware. I mean, he's really used to being the head of the, the army and he's He's not really aware of all the, I mean, he's aware of the backfighting, backfighting that's going on, but he's not playing it well. He's not figuring it well. And what he really wants to do is to develop the American economy the same way that other Westerners like Abraham Lincoln did. So one of the first and most important things on his personal agenda is for America to annex what was at the time known as Santo Domingo. We now know it as the Dominican Republic. And he he decides that he wants to do this and Santo Domingo thinks it's a ducky idea. So he sends his personal secretary, again loyalty going on here, Orville Babcock, down to I'm sorry, but isn't this stuff fun? Right now in the 19th century, it's like six guys doing all this and it's all gonna explode in like a year. But, um, but you know, I, it's much harder, once you get into the late 20th century, it's much harder to find these few guys with names like Orville Babcock doing all this stuff. And I can't tell you as much as I'd like to about him because um, he is corrupt. But anyway, so, um, so Grant sends Babcock down to negotiate a treaty in, San, in uh, what is Santo Domingo at the time. And he brings it back. And he brings it back at the end of 1869. And by then, Grant knows he's got a problem with, um, with Sumner. And so he, um, he realizes that he's got to be, be can amend his fences with Sumner because Sumner is the chair of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, which is an incredibly important committee in the 19th century. And it's a very powerful position. It's really the senior position in the Senate. Um, although the judiciary is very, very important as well, as well as the finance committee, those are really the top three, but sort of the, the head of the Senate um, uh, Foreign Affairs Committee is like, Foreign Relations Committee is kind of the, the dawn of the Senate, if you will. So Grant actually walks over to, Chum, uh, to Sumner's house one evening and Sumner's having a dinner party and he's having a dinner party with um, uh, two or three or four newspaper men. I don't remember how many. Sumner is very close to newspaper men and this is gonna matter a lot over the next two years. So Grant goes over there and he, he hands him the treaty and he says, you know, look, we, we got this treaty and, and I want your support for it. And what happened next is unclear because everybody at, who was witness to this and there were witnesses tells a different story. But Grant and the newspaper men who were in attendance believed that Sumner had given Grant a promise that he would support the treaty. And if Sumner supports a treaty from the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, it's going to go through. So all of them believed that Sumner said, yes, I'm, I'm on board with this. Sumner later remembered that, in fact, all he had said is that he would give it his fullest consideration. In any case, you can see exactly where this is going. Sumner went into Senate and he killed the treaty. When he killed the treaty annexing uh, Dominican Republic, as in the then it's known as Santo Domingo. So if you see that, that's what they're up to is Santo Domingo. When that happens, Grant is furious because he feels like his signature issue that was going to be so good for America to expand into the Caribbean and to really work with the, um, the black population there, that this has been shot dead in the water. And, um, and it's, it's, it's for many reasons, it's a very difficult thing for, um, for uh, Sumner to shoot down. He's got to do, go through a lot of convolutions to do it. And it's pretty clear it's a power struggle with Grant. So Grant is furious. And at that point, he cements his relationship with Conklin. And Conkling uh, thinks this is great because he's now calling the shots behind the scene. And Sumner does something that is so Sumner 
he he goes to the press instead of like trying to work this out he believes that the american people and the Amer and the republican party is going to be on his side over grant this really popular president who won the civil war and he goes to the press and he starts attacking grant in the press um in really really um unfortunate terms not like like we have a political debate going on but really he's scathing in the press and it shows up and when this happens of course members of the Republican Party are horrified. I mean, they may not, might not like uh, Conkling and they may not like Grant, but the last thing you want when you have finally gotten a Republican government is for it to tear itself apart. And that's exactly what's gonna happen. Um, uh, so the, the, important, the other important part about Sumner's relationship with all these uh, uh, journalist, uh, journalist fellows, is that um, one of his dearest friends is a man named Carl Schertz. And Carl Schertz was also a, a Republican general in the war. He's an immigrant from Germany. I'm sorry, an immigrant from Germany from this side. And he had been in the German Revolution of 1848. His memoirs, by the way, are on the shelves behind me. And his memoirs are gripping. They are just gripping. Uh, he actually, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to give that spoiler away. If anybody is interested in the history of Schertz or the 1848 German Revolution, um, those chapters in his memoirs, which are available online, are um, really worth reading because he barely escapes and he does tell the story of how he escapes. He's also a brilliant writer. He's a journalist, right? So he's a brilliant writer. And so anyway, so Schertz wants desperately to be a senator. And he can't be a president because he's an immigrant. So he wants to become a senator. So he moves from his home state of Wisconsin, home state, the state he lives in, from Wisconsin down to Missouri. And in Missouri, there's a whole problem going on. And the problem in Missouri is that if you remember your Civil War history, Missouri is absolutely split by the Civil War. Remember, Missouri is the only slave state above that 3630 Missouri Compromise line. So it's a northern state, but the people there enslave other human beings. And so what happens in Missouri is the state is completely torn apart by the Civil War. And it's torn apart to the extent that we actually get from Missouri in this period the rise of um, of outlaw gangs like the Jesse, the, the Jesse James gang. It's actually not, I shouldn't have said that because it's not going to form, and the gang, James gang is not going to form until after the war. But what happens is the Confederates organize around a guerrilla named, uh, named William Cantrell and they become known as, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Quantrell. And Quantrell's raiders um, do, do something that, that unionists consider very unsporting. They ride into a town on horseback with two guns and they, they ride in with their guns blazing at the civilians, not at military people, but at civilians. And by the time the people can scramble for their guns, they've ridden back out of town. And Quantrill's raiders become so hated during the war that, um, that the U.S. military comes through and actually evacuates a number of Missouri counties to try and kill the, the base of Quantrill's raiders and the, and the Confederate guerrillas. So this has been going on in Missouri and during the war. And when the Missourians write a new state constitution in 1865, the people who write it are all Republicans and they're all unionists. And they hate the Confederate guerrillas so much that they write into this constitution, this state constitution, that if you have supported the Confederacy in any way, like you fed breakfast to your brother and he was a soldier, a Confederate soldier, or you deliver a letter, um, you can never hold office in Missouri. You, uh, you can't be a teacher, you can't be a lawyer, you can't be a minister, and you have to take an oath of loyal, uh, uh, an oath that you've always been loyal to the United States, and, um, and that, that basically anybody who's ever supported the Confederacy will never have a civic identity in Missouri. Well, this constitution is, is written under a man named Charles Drake. And, um, and Charles Drake is uh, the leader of the Republican Party in Missouri, and his opponents call this constitution the, the draconian constitution. It's kind of a pun waiting to happen, right? So, um, so this comes up for a vote in, in, um, in Missouri, and even though only Republicans are allowed to vote in it, it's so extreme that the vote is extremely close. It almost, the, the Drake constitution almost doesn't go into effect. In the end, it does, but I think it's about 2,000 votes. But, um, out of close to 100,000 cast. Um, so it, but, but so Missouri's got this situation where um, basically if you're a Democrat, which would have supported the Confederacy, you're, you have no civic identity. And that's a problem in a number of ways, but it's certainly a problem after 1868 when all the actual Confederate states have come back into the Union. 
And um, and then after 1870, when when Georgia comes in, what that what that literally means is that Confederates in the South now have a civic identity. They've been readmitted to uh, to America, and they can vote, and they can hold office, and they can be teachers, and they can be ministers, whatever. But if you're in Missouri, which was not a Confederate state, even though its star shows up on the Confederate flag, um, it was technically the Union considered it a, a Union state. Um, you don't have those rights if you're a Democrat. So Missouri becomes this microcosm of what America should be. What is the, you know, what is, what does it mean to participate in American society? Are the Republicans really trying to put together a free, free labor state, you know, free labor government, or are they simply trying to run everything and keep and create a one party state? And so Missouri becomes this real microcosm, and this is why Jesse James becomes a folk hero, because Jesse James is a, a, a thief and a murderer. I mean, this is just not negotiable. But he he can't. He he writes to newspapers, and he says, um, he, "There's actually a newspaper guy in Missouri who um, who tries to lionize him and, and makes him this cause celeb of of the fact Democrats don't have any rights in Missouri." And he says, you know, I'm as pure as the driven snow. Actually, that's the newspaper editor saying that. James never says he's pure as the driven snow, but the newspaper editor does. He says he's an angel of light, and um, but he he has been been accused of crimes, and he can't defend himself because as a Democrat in Missouri, he can't get a a, a lawyer, and he can't none, no Democrats can sit on a jury, so he can't get representation, and essentially he is a victim, an independent victim of the state. This is why we know Jesse James as being this independent hero. Um, this also uh, ties in to the rise in this period. This is, uh, this, is, this, this is 1869, 1870. This ties into the rise of the cowboy image that I talked about before in so many different places. You know, this is really when Westerners grab hold of that idea of the cowboy image and the cowboy is becoming more visible in the West because of the rise of the cattle industry in the, 18, in the 1870s, really. Um, you're going to have... Uh, uh, Ned Butline, another re re newspaper guy, talking about or doing a play about um, uh, Buffalo Bill in 1872. It's all this so, so this ferment of cowboys and individualism and the idea of a cowboy being this independent guy who just wants a fair shake from the government also bleeds into what's happening in Missouri, which is still really chaotic. Um, and this idea of Jesse James as this hero. So what happens is. Um, Schertz wants to be senator. I remember I started out by saying that. Schertz wants to be senator. So he goes down to Missouri, uh, where there is a big uh, German-American population, so he figures he can probably get elected. And he, um, uh, um, he runs for senator, and he runs for senator as a Republican against the Drake machine. And when I say he runs for senator, Remember, senators are still appointed by the legislature in this period. You don't actually run for senator, but you try and get your people into the legislature. And what Schertz does is he takes on the Drake machine. And he takes on the Drake machine, Republican machine, by saying they're a closed circuit, they're corrupt, they are simply trying to, um, to get all they can out of the, the population by... Um, by keeping Democrats out of out of office and by not letting Democrats vote. So he kind of picks up that Democratic language and says the Drake people are corrupt and he manages to win. This the state legislature sides with Schertz and Schertz is elected to become a senator. Well what does he do? In 69 he takes that into the Senate and he gives a fire and brimstone speech against Grant. Now he's a Republican. He's a, a Grant, I mean he's a he's a, a, a GOP senator. And he makes this speech against Grant in which he says Grant is corrupt. Grant is, um, is supporting uh, black rights solely to get their votes so he can stay in power. And he needs to share power with the Democrats and he, and he needs, to, he needs to, to leave office. You know, Grant is corrupt and he's not a good leader. Well, what is he trying to do? He's trying to support his friend Sumner to replace Grant. This is absolutely a move to put Sumner in power over Grant, this idea that Grant is somehow corrupt. So how does this happen? Um, the more, the, the more that, um, that he does this, there is an election for, sen for uh, governor in, in Missouri in 1870. And when that happens, 
these sort of disgruntled Republicans managed to elect their own fellow with the help of Democrats into the Missouri governorship. And this is a guy named B. Gratz Brown. And I only mentioned him, you'll probably never hear him again, because you should Google him. He has got the largest ears of anybody I have ever seen. And it's like every once in a while, I'll put him like once a year, I put him on Twitter because it's like, how does everybody not know this man? Anyway, so Google him. Anyway, B. Gratz Brown is the governor of Missouri after 1870. And people like Schertz and Sumner and Brown believe that they're going to be able to create a new movement that's going to draw the rug out from under Grant and create this new middle ground for Americans um, to to uh, to essentially put Sumner in power, but to to limit the the uh, the power of the Republicans in um, um, in uh, in Grant's camp, Conkling and Grant and all those people. And um, they begin to call themselves liberal Republicans. And again, this is, this is such a flash in the pan moment in so many ways, but it really matters because that word liberal there, liberal Republicans does not refer to 20th century liberalism. It refers backward to 17th, uh, 18th century liberalism and the idea that the state should not be powerful enough to imprint in, in, in impinge on the rights of individuals. And what they're really doing is they're making a bid for Democrats who don't like the idea of big government helping out African Americans. So it's this weird kind of a middle ground that says, yeah, we're not going to use the, the federal government to create black rights because it costs too much in tax dollars and it makes white, white Democrats mad. Um, but we also like the idea of everybody being able to work their way up. So they're starting to coalesce around this idea. Meanwhile, back in Washington, Grant's got his own problem. And that problem back in, um, in, in Washington is that the KKK has risen in the South. After African Americans helped to put Grant in the White House, the KKK gets more and more active, not less and less. And the, the, the Grant administration desperately wants to enforce black rights across the South, but what do you do to enforce rights in a state when the state won't do anything about it? I love this. You create the Department of Justice. This is why we have a Department of Justice. Under the Grant administration, they create the Department of Justice and they send federal officials down to the South to um, to round up the KKK, and they do so. They do so very effectively. But Grant has a really hard time making this happen because a lot of people in the Republican Party, in the Congress, who you know two years ago would have thought this was just great, the best thing since sliced bread, you know, now they're looking at it and going, wait a minute, that looks like an awful lot of federal power now being used against the states and the Democrats that we kind of need to win office. So Grant actually uses the Department of Justice and what are known as the KKK Acts to go ahead and enforce black rights with federal power. But this is a really important moment for this story that I'm spinning of the Republican Party. And that is, it's a wonderful opening for the, the journalists who want to get rid of Grant and replace him with Sumner. And weirdly, 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 the first person out of the box to start to turn against Grant over his attempt to enforce black rights in the South is Horace Greeley. Horace Greeley, who was one of the earliest Republicans, um, who uh, the earliest Republican newspaper for sure, who has been always been staunch in his support for black rights, um, an abolitionist, I don't know if I said that, he turns against Grant's policies in the South. And he does so again to undermine the Grant presidency and because he really prefers the leadership of Charles Sumner and Charles Sumner's wing of the party. This is not like Sumner is out there, um, you know, totally as a, as a candidate for anything but his senatorship at this point. But, but they don't like Grant and they want to undermine Grant. So Greeley turns against Grant um, in, in 1871, really dramatically in May of 1871, when he starts to hit on the idea in the New York Daily Tribune, which by the way, is also available on that Library of Congress website I told you about. And if you're interested, it is uh, the, the article that I'm talking about, the first major article I'm talking about is in, I think it's May 4th of 1871. And if anybody wants a little piece of trivia here, my second book called The Death of Reconstruction, the, the cover of it has a newspaper uh, that's sort of in relief 
that's the the cover of the newspaper with the Greeley column on it. Um, and, and that's again real trivia. But if you if you want to figure out which column it is, you can probably go on some photograph of that book and blow up the date, and you'll be able to go then cross check it to the uh, to the Library of Congress uh, web website that has the New York Daily Tribune. If you're interested, all right. So uh, Greeley starts to say that Grant is simply trying to create an empire, that in fact, African Americans in the South are not good hard workers, that, and he picks up the democratic language here that has been filtered through Missouri, and he says really that African Americans are poor people um, that are trying to use their political leverage to redistribute wealth. And you will recognize that from last week that Andrew Johnson begins to articulate that in 1866 with his vetoes of the Civil Rights Bill and the Freedmen's Bureau, the Second Freedmen's Bureau Bill. Um, so, so Greeley starts to put this in the newspaper. And it, it, um, it's a really, really powerful argument, especially coming from Greeley, this idea that you know, the Republican Party is not trying to enforce civil rights. Of course, it's trying to enforce civil rights. The, the KKK is running amok down there, especially in South Carolina. But um, but that it's just an attempt to keep a group of Republic, corrupt Republicans in power. Um, so what happens on the heels of that is that a number of people in South Carolina organize what's known as the South Carolina Taxpayers uh, Convention. And the South Carolina Taxpayers Convention is a, a really important moment in that it takes a look at the fact that in South Carolina, which has a majority black population, by the way, the legislature of South Carolina is a majority black. And what they, they what the taxpayers argue is that they don't they don't care that the legislators are black. They don't have a problem with that. Well, that's ridiculous. Of course they do. They've been saying things about that since forever, but really in political affairs for the last decade or the last um, six years. But their real problem is that um, these poor people, um, uh, the, a, a proletariat parliament, as one person puts it, because they're starting to pay attention to Marx at this period, um, is, uh, is legislating for people who pay taxes. And those tax dollars are being wasted on contracts that provide benefits for African Americans that uh, they don't that that are, there are, are unearned. That African Americans are lazy, they say, they are just out of the fields, they don't want to work, and instead what they want to do is have political power so they can redistribute wealth through contracts into their own pockets. And um, I wish I could show you some images from this, but this starts to resonate. And, and quickly people start to pick up in the newspapers, especially the Northern newspapers, about the dangers of having this proletariat parliament or these socialists in power. And they start to talk really dramatically in 1871 about socialism. Now, if you have access to, uh, to historical newspapers or certainly you have access to the archives of the New York Times and you search for the word socialism, you will see it starting dramatically there's a little bubble of it from 1840 on for weird reasons, but then it'll, it'll, you'll get dramatic hits beginning in 1871. And that happens not least because also in 1871, starting in March of 1871, people in Paris get upset about the treaty that their government has negotiated after the Franco-Prussian War, and they say that, um, that they've been sold out, and they take over the city of Paris and they create the Paris Commune. This becomes headline news in America because Americans look at it as an example of workers taking over a government. And for really weird reasons, um, Americans pay a lot of attention to the Paris Commune, in part because we have a, trans, a transatlantic cable for the first time that transmits information and it's expensive. So they like really salacious information to go along it. And after the Franco-Prussian War, there's not a lot of stuff happening in Europe. So they pay a lot of attention to the Paris Commune. And also in part because the American ambassador to uh, Paris is the only foreign ambassador who's allowed to remain in Paris during the, the siege that's going to happen uh, when the when the the troops come and surround the commune, and he is expect widely expected to be the next Republican nominee for president, so people pay a lot of attention to what he's saying. This is Elihu Washburn, and um and there's um there's uh he actually wrote again on the shelves back here are his memoirs, memoirs of a minister to France, talking about how this happens. He actually sends um. Uh, dispatches from the commune out of the city of Paris by balloon 
Um, but they come into, uh, they, they get into the transatlantic cable and they come to America and the Paris Commune makes headline news day after day after day with Republicans and Democrats both, but certainly Republicans looking at what's happening in Paris as an example of what happens if you give workers too much political power. And what they see is a group of people who burn the Tuileries, who barricade themselves in the streets, who, um, who uh, um, uh, behead us priests, who redistribute wealth, and the women actually fill up glass bottles with this newfangled stuff called petroleum, and they stick rags in it, and they set it on fire, and they throw it in the basements of buildings, and thereby proving that entire society has been upended. If, if, if women do that, you know things have gone completely amok. So Americans are paying attention to the Paris Commune, and they're looking at what's happening in the South, and you've got the rise, as I've talked about before so many times, of organized labor in America. Beginning in 1866, you've got uh, workers organizing as the National Labor Union and demanding um, an eight-hour day and work workplace safety and a better chance of um, better wages as well. And so Americans look at that and they start to worry about what it means to have workers in charge of government. And then, just as people are starting to think about uh, what they call the dangerous classes, a very famous book um, that mentions the dangerous classes in America in this period, you have the horror of the Chicago fire. On October 8, 1871, uh, just as the National Labor Union was supposed to meet again, it didn't actually, it got postponed, um, Chicago catches fire. And people look at this and they say, this is, this is poor workers destroying the city. And this is where we get the legend of Mrs. O'Leary's cow, an immigrant who's so stupid she doesn't know not to put a lantern with fire in, uh, in near hay. That's an that's a urban legend. It was not Mrs. O'Leary and her cow. But that's the popular image that, you know, these dangerous classes are taking over society. They're going to destroy uh, Western society in general, but certainly American society. And of course, it doesn't happen that by it doesn't hurt that by then Marx's first international has a branch in New York City. So people are paying attention to the dangers of workers and they um, they are really nervous about it. And this is going to give a big boost to the liberal Republicans, who, of course, are starting to talk about the dangers of the lower classes. And you can see this really dramatically in um, in newspapers like uh, like E.L. Godkin's The Nation, uh, that they're worried about workers. And they start to say African-Americans should not have a civic, have a civil, have, be able to vote. They should not have a say over how money, taxpayer money is spent because they're going to be levelers. They're going to redistribute wealth. So by 1871, liberal Republicans think they've got a real shot at getting the White House. And they start to, they, they, when, the, when they can't really get their way in the Republican convention, they simply have their own convention and they decide that they're going to nominate their own leader. And they expect to, to nominate um, their own newspaper man, a very well-connected Massachusetts man. But in fact, the newspaper editors get together and they turn to Horace Greeley. And when they nominate Horace Greeley, it's, it's a real problem because Greeley is, you know, a, a, just a mercurial guy. And he has, you know, been vicious about Democrats, but then he went ahead and bailed um, Jefferson Davis out of prison. And, you know, he's like hot and cold on people. So he basically has pissed everybody off. I mean, sorry, he's made everybody angry. And he basically, like, like he's, he's kind of a, a weak link. And the, the Democrats look at this and they're like, seriously, you nominated Horace Greeley, who said we all, you know, at one point said we're all traitors and should be killed. And he does this and he does that. And people who might otherwise have supported the um, Greeley um, look at his candidacy and they say, uh-oh, he's going to work with the Democrats. And the Democrats are going to destroy our financial system. Because ever since the war, the Democrats have been saying that the financial system is rigged for the wealthy. And um, because bonds are paid for in, in, in gold, I'm sorry, are the interest in bonds is paid in gold. And that's a real sticking point for uh, Democrats. And I talked about that last week and why that's in the 14th Amendment. So the Democrats sort of hold their noses and say, yeah, I guess we can work with Greeley. But the bottom line is that they're not going to work with Greeley. It's a really bad nomination. But who knows that? So the, the Republicans now look at this hiving off of people like Greeley. And Sumner's 
Sumner's busy being Sumner, even though this whole thing, he kind of instigated this whole thing. He doesn't really want to say, yes, go this direction because he recognizes how weak really is. In the end, he kind of says, yes, but, you know, it's so weak, it doesn't really do a lot. Um, but what happens is if you're a financier looking in at this in from Wall Street, you look at this and you're like, well, you know, the truth is we didn't really like the Republicans much because we didn't like their their growth of government and we didn't like their taxation. But we sure like them a lot better than we like the Democrats. So the Republicans come out in, I'm sorry, the businessmen come out in force for Grant. This is the major switch in the in the financial world in the 19th century. Financiers had generally, broad brush here, had generally before the war sided with the Democrats. But when this happens, when it looks like Greeley is going to work with the Democrats who are going to destroy the, the finances, financial system that was set up during the war, the financiers sort of at first hold their noses, but then come out really enthusiastically for Grant. They throw parties in Wall in 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 um, New York City. Wall Street turns out and they say, we're in it for Grant. This is really huge because, um, of course, it elevates Roscoe Conkling, who's friends with all these guys. Um, they're Thurlow Weed guys. They're also Roscoe Conkling guys. And it ties the formal Republican Party to big business. This is the big switch. This is why 1872 matters so much. All right, so we've got this switch going on. We haven't had the election yet. We, we've got this switch going on. And the, the, the liberal Republicans uh, are in the demo. I mean, they're, it's going to the Democrats are technically in there, too. But I'm going to go with the liberal Republicans because this is the Republican Party here. Um, the liberal Republicans are really in trouble because they're dragging Horace Greeley along here. And Horace Greeley, by the way, is sick as well. He's going to actually die uh, before the election. But um, he it, they're dragging him along. And they, they can't get traction because people are looking at them and they're like, really, this is, you want us to vote for him instead of, I don't know, the guy who won the Civil War? But what they really need to do is they need to prove that the Republicans are corrupt. They need to prove that Grant is corrupt. And astonishingly, they find a great story. And that great story is uh, the credit mobilier scandal. Now this scandal, I absolutely love, and I'm going to have to, go, uh, sorry, I'm a historian. I'm going to have to go back into it a little bit for you to understand it because it's actually very complicated. Um, but, but, but it's, it's, it's an interesting story when you, when you untangle it all. So the story behind the credit mobilier scandal is this. I talked about and have talked about in a number of places how the Republican Party starts the Union Pacific Railroad in 1862. It doesn't take off because in 1862 there's so many better places for a businessman to put his money because you know you can you can um, uh, put money behind a factory that's going to be supplying the troops. You can you know there's all kinds of places where you can make bank. You can speculate in greenbacks. You can speculate in bonds. You can do all this kind of stuff. Why would you build a road across nowhere? So it doesn't happen. And what happens then is that in 1864, Congress needs to rewrite the law. And it does rewrite the law, but it rewrites the law in, um, in a pretty complicated way. And what they do is instead of sort of saying, you know, we hear the Union Pacific, and I don't know about you, but you probably think in your mind, oh, it's a railroad. It's actually not. When they write the second Union Pacific Railroad bill, they bring together a lot of other bills and a lot of other railroads. And there's the California railroads that are gonna make up the big four out there, Leland Stanford and his people. But there's also the Kansas Pacific Railroad. They wanna bring the Kansas Pacific Railroad into this. And the Kansas Pacific Railroad is run by a guy named Durant, named Thomas Durant, and he's really corrupt. All right, so Thomas Durant is really worried when they write the 64 bill that he's going to get cut out. So he goes to Congress and he um, he buys up a lot of goodwill and he buys it up for the Kansas Pacific Railroad and he keeps a book. He keeps a book of this. All right. So then um, they the the Union Pacific Railroad, the Kansas Pacific does get included in the Union Pacific Railroad, but everybody knows Durant's a bad egg. So when it comes time to, to run the, six, the, the Union Pacific Railroad, and the Union Pacific Railroad has a lot of real sweeteners in, that, in the 64 law, when it comes time to do that, the guys who are the, on the board of the Union Pacific Railroad think of a great way to make money legally. It's, it's immoral, but it's not illegal. I mean, and you, I shouldn't have said immoral. That's too much. I'll explain it. You can decide for yourselves. Um, uh, 
but they don't like Durant. They know Durant is a bad egg. So what they do is they create their own company to build the railroad. Now, when Congress wrote the 64 law and the 62 law, for that matter, they didn't foresee this because the idea of a corporation of this size is something completely new. And I promise you, I've read all the congressional debates on this, and there are a lot of them. So I know this stuff really well. Um, so they didn't, they didn't believe that they sort of thought you know, it, before the Civil War, a corporation was something that was run by people with real civic mentality. Like they wanted to, at least they believed they wanted to do something really good for um, for the people, and this was their way to do it. So, so Congress believes that this is kind of what's going to happen with the Union Pacific because the guys who are going to do it are guys who are going to be civic minded because they're going to put their money into this rather than putting their money into making horseshoes or whatever. So, or, or speculating in, in greenbacks. So when they write the law, they never put in the law that, the, that the, the Union Pacific has to accept the lowest bids for each mile of railroad. And the way the law is written, it provides the Union Pacific Railroad can borrow money up to a certain amount for every mile of railroad constructed, less over the plains than over the mountains, for example. But there's a limit to how much they can borrow. But they are never required to accept the lowest bids, which kind of made sense. You know, you sort of think you get, you do something, you get three bids, you take the lowest one or the one that looks best. You don't automatically take the highest. What the credit mobilia people did is they organized their own company and the people on that board were the same people as were the board of the Union Pacific Railroad with the exception of Durant and his friends because they don't want them involved. And this is their way of cutting him out of the Union Pacific business, in part because they want to make more money themselves, but in part because they know Durant is, is a rotter. So they put together this board and what they do is, you know, basically they're the same people, is that they make bids to build the miles of railroad for the Union Pacific Railroad, but the bids are always the absolute top money that the government allows. And what that means is that the government, that, I'm sorry, the, the Union Pacific Railroad then goes out and raises the money by um, both by selling lands that the government has given to them, uh, Lakota lands, by the way, um, uh, actually not that low. It, it's not going to be Lakota that, that low. It's going to be former Kiowa lands, whatever, different story. Anyway, um, they sell lands and they also issue bonds. And what the government has done is they've given them lands and they've promised to guarantee the interest on the bonds. The government never has to do that, by the way. The Union Pacific Railroad pays for itself. But what this also means is that the guys running Credit Mobilier make bank. All right, so back to 1872. This is starting up. You know, it's pretty clear that Credit Mobilier is gonna be really valuable. And, um, and the, the newspaper men for 72 are looking for a scandal. And they think they found it in Credit Mobilier. And again, you can follow all this yourself if you want in the New York Sun, because that's the newspaper that breaks this. And the story behind this, behind what happens with the Credit Mobilier scandal, is that there's a man who claims to have asked to buy stock in, the, in Credit Mobilier. And um, because they, you, know, you can be a stockholder in Credit Mobilier. And he's, he writes a letter, according to him, in this lawsuit that he files in Pennsylvania, he writes a letter to the directors and he says, I want to buy, and I don't remember how many shares of stock, let's say 100 for the sake of argument. I want to buy 100 shares of stock in Credit Mobilier and I'm going to go on vacation and I will pay you when I get back. Well, he goes on vacation, but he goes on vacation for months. And while he does that, Credit Mobilier stock goes through the roof. So he comes back from vacation and he writes to them again and he says, okay, here's my money for the credit mobilier stock that I told you I was going to buy last, you know, three months ago. And I want you, here's the money for that. And I want you to pay me all the interest that I would have made, uh, had, a, you know, because I reserved the stock back then. And the directors of credit mobilier are like, you're nuts. There's no way you can waltz in here all these months later and simply say, I'm going to buy it. For, at the price from three months ago and give me all the stock dividends that, that I should have had between now and then. So he, they say, sorry, you're out of luck. He sues them. And he sues them. And he when he when he sues them, he claims that he knows that they have bought off Republican senators. And he claims to have a list, another list in American history, an envelope on the back of which is written all the bribes that he has heard them make to Republican senators. Well, in the course of the cross-examination, which again you can read in these newspapers, it becomes it comes out that this envelope he has, the names and the bribes are written in his own hand on it. And he under cross-examination admits that these are just things he overheard 
when he was in the credit mobilier uh, offices. And uh, this is what he remembered about what he had overheard. That is the evidence for the credit mobilier scandal. The idea that the credit mobilier people were buying off senators. Um, they, uh, and, and the senators and congressmen are listening to this and they're like, you're on drugs. They don't say that. They say, uh, this is preposterous, you know, whatever. Because they said, why should we have bribed them? You know, we're behind this and we're making money off it legally. So why would we have to bribe this? There was never any anybody saying this wasn't a good idea. So there was no need to bribe us. This doesn't make any sense at all. And um, this, this scandal gets picked up by the newspapers, who of course are trying to elect um, Horace Greeley. You know, they're, they're, tr they're in the tank for Horace Greeley and they're trying to tear down Grant's Republican Party. And this is it. That's the credit mobilia scandal. Now, later on, there's going to be, of course, there's going to be enormous uh, railroad corruption in the states. And I didn't have time to tell you about that. And later on, there's going to be a lot of, of uh, Republic, uh, railroad corruption. And in a later investigation, Durant's notebook that I talked about from 64 is going to be introduced into Congress, into the testimony, and everything gets very confused. But the credit mobilier scandal itself is this. It is these guys running this, um, this railroad and doing so not illegally. You know, I think people like me anyway look at this and say they took advantage of a pretty big loophole here to make a lot of money. It was a lot of money that didn't cost the, the, the government anything. The government never had to guarantee those, those, um, that interest on the bonds. Those bond, that was always paid. And, um, and, and yet, you know, they obviously were following the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. That does not mean that the Republican Party in this era was corrupt. Um, it doesn't, I mean, certainly certain people were, but that whole idea of Grant being corrupt and the credit mobilia scandal being this incredible slur on the administration is really a political construct specifically for the election of 1872. All right, so where does that leave us? Um, where this leaves us is the idea that, um, you know, going into the election of 1872, you've got the Republican Party now firmly working with big business because of this split in the party. You know, it was not clear going into Grant's term that things were going to turn out this way. But he has to turn to them to get to New York, to get New York to win in the, uh, win the New York's electoral votes in 1872. And he, he turns to Roscoe Conkling, who is corrupt. And you get, again, this idea of, um, of the liberal Republicans, that the credit mobilier scandal proves that the Republicans are in bed with big business. And they're going to be going forward. But that's why I, I focused on these four years, is because you've got this enormous shift. And it's enormous, an enormous shift because of the split in the party. It's really driven by the Republican Party, which I just find mind-boggling, frankly. I mean, and you can see the importance here of certain personalities, like Sumner's, who was not willing to take a back seat to Grant. So where do we end this? We end this with Grant being elected in a landslide in 72, because Democrats simply stay home. They're like, we can't stomach Greeley. And in any case, he's he doesn't make it to the election. So Grant wins in a landslide in 72. And we have done two things in this period. We have, first of all, um, cemented in the political discourse, not only through Democratic newspapers, but also through Republican newspapers, this idea that comes out of the early post-war years that African-American political activity is simply a redistribution of wealth. It is socialism after the Paris Commune of 1871. It is called communism. This is where we get the link behind the idea that, that, that poor people and people of color and later women going to be added in the 20th century, that their political voice means a form of redistribution of wealth from hardworking white male taxpayers to people at the bottom, and that therefore having people of color and women having a political voice amounts to socialism or communism. And obviously you can see this all the way up to the present. When you have, for example, Mitch McConnell saying there's no way he's going to allow these co these socialist programs to go through the Senate. And that's that's where this idea gets cemented in the political discourse because the Republicans pick it up from the Democrats because they're trying to undermine Grant. We also get 
in this brief period a real revolution in the loyalties of financiers and big business. They switched their loyalties, not all of them, but for the most part, they switched their loyalties from the Democrats to the Republicans. This is going to make the Republicans the party of big business going forward um, into the 18, uh, 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s. So what we've seen here, I hope, so far is the rise, first of all, of the Republicans as a party dedicated to the idea of equality of opportunity and equality of access to resources. And then you've seen how there is this backlash against that based in racism and based in xenophobia and later on based in sexism and how that's going to tie the political party to big business. And once it's tied to big business, what we're going to do next week is show how that um, that perverts, if you will, or certainly influences the political system and our legislation to make wealth rise to the top and then something else is going to happen. And I'm going to leave you there with that cliffhanger. And, uh, and I hope to see you next week. As you can tell, I absolutely love this stuff. And I think you really have to understand it in order to understand where America is today. Anyway, thank you very much for coming here and for putting up with my very tired excitement about this. My name is Heather Cox Richardson. I'm a professor of history. At, uh, I'm a professor of history. I do not speak for my employer when I do these history videos. And with luck, I'll see you here again next week, Thursday, one o'clock. Thank you very much for coming.